Hello everybody, I hope that you're comfortable wherever you're at. As you can tell, we're not doing our live stream today because we're gonna be listening to our senior pastor, Jerry Dearman, and he's gonna bring the word. The title of the message is called How We Win. He's gonna walk us through some points in scripture to show us that we have everything we need to win. We have everything we need to succeed. You know, Jesus said he gives us all authority over the enemy. And also in Corinthians, it says that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. And so we have everything we need to succeed. We have everything we need to take, ta take back territory for the kingdom of God. And so while you're watching this at home, we're going to be watching the same message here on campus. And so I want you to do this after the message. Go into the comment section and just type in maybe a point, two points, three points of what you received from the word. So as you're listening, make sure you're taking notes and at the end, write something and I'll check a little bit later and I'll respond to your comments. I want to know what you got. So let me do this. Let me pray and then Pastor Jerry is going to take it from there. Father, I thank you that you, uh, you're going to speak to us. And God, you give us everything we need to win. Our hearts are open to receive the good word of God. And we thank you for strength and power. Lord, we thank you for your abundant love. And I know, God, that you're with us as we're listening to this message. So speak to us, change your lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. If you have your Bibles, open up to a couple of places. Find, if you would, Proverbs 14, Proverbs chapter 14, and then hold that and open up also to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. But I'm going to start today in Proverbs chapter 14. While you're turning, I'm going to tell you my favorite quote that I recently heard. My favorite quote, at the risk of somebody thinking I'm getting too political. I, I don't mind being political, but I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but, but this is just humor, okay? Everybody cool? Everybody good? Humor, okay? But, uh, but it is a real quote. I can't say everything the guy said, but it was from a rapper named 50 Cent. Now, I, I don't know him. I, I've never listened to his songs, music, so I really don't know anything about him. So don't judge me, all right? I don't know. But I heard this, and uh, I, he, had, he had heard about uh, President Trump's plan to make permanent his tax cuts and to c cut, more, cut taxes even more. And then he'd heard about uh, uh, former Vice President Biden's plan to increase taxes and such. And uh, then he, you know, some expletives came out, you know, when he heard about the increase of taxes because uh, apparently he's above that threshold of how much you make, you know, and the income and such. Well, anyway, he said, he, he said, well, here's why I decided I'm voting for Trump. He said, because, because uh, I'm 50, 50 cent. He said, I don't want to be 20 cent. <laughs> that is my favorite quote, I think, of all the election here. <laughs> I don't want to be 20 cent. You know? so, so anyway, wherever you stand on all that, I don't know. But you got to admit, that was funny. <laughs> that, that was very clever and funny. I, I enjoyed it. Okay, here we go. Proverbs chapter 14. And I want to look down here at the 34th verse, Proverbs 14, 34. I love the book of Proverbs. Uh, years ago, I did a whole maybe 32-part series on the book of Proverbs called Wisdom for Life. Just took topic after topic after topic. Didn't take it by chapters, took it by topics. And still available, I think, on solalives.com. But love this book. But listen to now. Proverbs chapter 14. In fact, let's all read out loud together. Proverbs 14, 34. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It's on the screens. Let's read. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Come on, let's read it again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Well, there's no question that we are in a very intense political environment. There's no question that, aside from politics, we are in a culture war. There is tension everywhere. There is frustration. There is anger. There is division in our nation. There's no question about that. Well, what does the Bible say? It says righteousness exalts a nation. Well, what do we need? We need righteousness. No matter what side of the aisle people find themselves on, 
we need to be after righteousness. Can you say amen to this? In other words, what is the right way to live? What is the right thing to do? What is the right way to treat people? What is the right way to govern? Because not, not just because somebody can make their case for how they govern, that doesn't mean it's the righteous way to govern. There are righteous ways and there are unrighteous ways. There are true, genuine, positive agendas and there are hidden, evil agendas. And we have to be interested in these things. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin, sin is a reproach to any people. Now, let's readily go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And listen to what Paul said. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation, the first two verses. The Apostle Paul said, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, I don't know about you, but I believe we are in the last times, that in the last times, some will depart from the true faith. Well, well, we've seen that, haven't we? We've seen that. There are people that even call themselves believers or Christians. And yet, when you get to talking to them about what they really believe, you'll find out, oh, you, you've abandoned the Bible. You no longer agree with God's word. And you think, well, I can believe in God, but not what he said. Well, no, no, if, if you're putting your faith in God and serving God, then you have to agree with what he says and say, well, I'm not God. He's God, and so I submit under his laws, and I no longer push my own agenda in conflict with him. See, so there are people who have turned from God. Look what it says. The Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith, they will follow deceptive spirits. Now, what is a deceptive spirit? A spirit that is getting you to go a different direction, but in a deceiving way. Not just saying, I want you to be anti-God. No, but coming up with clever ways to get you to disagree with what God's Word says. Deceptive spirits. And teachings that come from demons. Somebody said, well, I've never been to a seminar where a demon was speaking. Well, maybe you have, maybe you just didn't realize See, demons don't just speak like a human being out here where you can see them. They speak through human beings. They give human beings different logic patterns, different ways of thinking, ways to illustrate their points. But notice the Bible says that these teachings originate with demons. And they come and they teach people things. And the Bible said this is going to happen in the last days. People that used to be solid with the Lord are going to depart and begin to change the way that they believe things, change what they think, and think, well, we're being more enlightened. We're being more progressive. Listen, you don't get any brighter than God. When you start to disagree with God, you're not getting brighter. You're getting darker. Come on, somebody say amen to this. God is the brightest. He is the most enlightened, and the entrance of His Word gives light. The moment you divert from the Word of God, you become darker. Period. Somebody said, I don't like that. Well, I don't care. I didn't make this up. God, God said this. This is the ways of God. I tell you what, I, I want to put my faith in God and not in my own logic, and certainly not in somebody convincing me. So notice it says... People will depart from the true faith. They'll follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars. I believe some hypocrites don't even realize that they're being hypocritical because hypocrisy is so common today. They just think they're being human. But it's, it's wrong. They know that there are things that they're not saying. They're, they know that they're posting a narrative and they're they're speaking out a narrative that is not really what they're after. That's hypocrisy. And it's wrong. And the Bible says, yeah, that's going to happen in the last days and a lot of lying. You know, look at the hip hypocrites and liars. That's another way to say fake news. Amen. Right? And there's fake news, not just from newscasters, but people all over are posting on Facebook and everything, all kinds of things that are just not true. And some of them know it's not true. But they have... An agenda. And the Bible then says this, and their consciences are dead. What does that mean? That they've gone to the point with the Lord that they no longer are convicted of their sins. They don't have that inner voice inside saying, you know that's not true. 
you know that's not right. They don't have it anymore. When you get to that point, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. You, you, you feel no conviction for your wrongdoing. You don't feel bad about it at all. No mercy is in your heart. No conviction. May none of us get there. May we not even be close to that. Well, listen to what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to read it out of the God's Word translation. He said, you must understand this. In the last days, there will be violent periods of time. Come on. Anybody recognize anything? Even in this nation. Violence. Violent periods of time. People will be selfish and love money. They will brag, be arrogant, and use abusive language. Oh, we're watching it. I hope we're not doing it. Let's, let's witness but not involve ourselves. Let's not be part of this game. Arrogant and use abusive language. They will curse their parents. Yeah, that's on the list. And that's happening today. They will curse their parents. God said, no, honor your father and mother. Well, I don't like them. They did me wrong. Yeah, yeah, but that's what they did. You're not responsible for what they did. They are. They're accountable for that. But you are responsible for what you do. We can honor people we don't agree with. We can honor people that hurt us and offended us. But before the Lord, we still have to do what God told us to do. So they will curse their parents. Show no gratitude. Boy, that's happening today. Have no respect for what is holy. Boy, that's happening today too, isn't it? And lack normal affection for their families. They'll lack normal affection for their families. They will refuse to make peace with anyone. They'll just let strife go. And instead of saying, oh man, I better call that person. I better talk to him because you know, we had a fallout. No, they'll say, forget it. Forget it. I'll never talk to him again. They will be slanderous, lack self-control, be brutal, have no love for what is good. This is what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days. They will be traitors. They will be reckless and conceited. They will love pleasure rather than God. I would rather live in pleasure than to live right with God. That's the way the Bible says it'll be in the last days. Listen to 1 John 4, 3 from the English Standard Version. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist. Anything that's anti-Bible is also Antichrist. Christ is Messiah, right? The anointed one. Jesus is the Word of God. So if you're anti-Jesus, you're anti the Word of God. If you're anti the Word of God, you're anti-Jesus. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So we have the spirit of Antichrist. So what's the answer? So what do we do? What do we do? Sometimes we can give an answer, but it, it's an incomplete answer. I'm going to give you several things that we need to do. First of all, we need to know this. Jesus delegated to us, the body of Christ, the authority to address and confront these things. Jesus delegated it to us. We need to remember that. Listen to what he said in Luke 10, 19. Behold, what does behold mean? See this. I need you to see this. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of all the power of the enemy. I give you the authority, not just a little dab of it. No, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. That's a type of demonic spirits. And he said, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't be afraid to go into spiritual warfare because you have authority over the devil. Amen. You have authority over the devil. Would anybody be afraid if if you open the door, you heard something at the door, you open the door and a big old pit bull came in and started chewing on your leg? Huh? What, what, about, what about if a, a little chihuahua puppy, six weeks old, started walking in the door? Would you be afraid? 
No, you wouldn't be afraid. And you shouldn't be afraid of the devil any more than a chihuahua puppy. Are you listening to me? You have authority. You have authority. You have authority. The, the enemy does not have the right or the power to hurt you. You can confront him. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll do what? He'll flee. He'll flee. See, we need to know who we are and what authority we have. Jesus gave us authority. Second, he gave us his armor and weapons. Put on the whole armor of God, but you remember 2 Corinthians 10, 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, human level, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Our weaponry is far more powerful than nuclear power. Is this right? See, but if we don't believe it, we won't use it. But yet the Bible says this, he gave us weapons. And then third, he told us who we are fighting. You remember Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, human beings. Yeah, we're fighting them Democrats. Yeah, we're fighting them Republicans. Yeah, we're fighting them. You know. No, no, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, the Bible saying, you're looking at the problems that humans are causing, not realizing that there are demonic spirits controlling those humans, influencing those humans. And you can take care of what may be considered the the symptoms of the problem, but if you're not addressing those rulers, you, you can vote one person out and another person in, but if those demon spirits didn't change seats with the angels of God, then guess what? They're just going to influence the next person the same way. Amen. That's why we vote for people. We thought they were going to do this and that. And they don't always do this and that. You have to have the right influences. And so the Bible says we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. And then God showed us how the kingdom of God is structured. And I just want to lay this out for you. The kingdom of God is structured in a way that we should understand completely. And let me just tell you, Jesus taught us in John chapter 10 that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Well, what is the sheepfold? The sheepfold is where the sheep are. Well, who are the sheep? It's people. We're talking about this earth. Jesus said, whoever didn't come in by the door to this earth is a thief and a robber, but whoever enters by the door is the shepherd. Well, guess what? Jesus came through the door to get to this sheepfold. He was born here. How many of you remember in Bethlehem, he was born as a human being here. Just like that's how you got here and that's how Jesus came to this earth. He came being born of a human being. But he said, he who does not enter by the door is a thief and a robber, climbing up some other way. Well, who are we talking about? We're talking about the thief and the robbers called Satan and demons. They were never born here. They don't have a right to be here. They're climbing up another way through satanic and demon possession and oppression and influence. Is that right? And Jesus said, they're thieves and robbers. That's why when you say in the name of Jesus, get out, they have to flee. Why? Why? They don't belong here. They don't belong here. Their influence shouldn't happen here. Unfortunately, unaware people and unbelievers give them the right to do things, but they have to do it through human beings. So this is why we know how the kingdom of God, excuse me, the kingdom of darkness is structured in this country. How is it structured? It's structured according to the structure of human authority. So when you're talking about government, you have a president, you have Congress, you have a judicial branch and such. And guess what? So does the devil. Why? Because he has no authority to just do whatever he wants to do. He has to do it through human authority. And so he structures his authority the same way. It happens the same way with states, with the governors, with the legislat legislators and such. It happens the same way in schools, with districts and principals and teachers. The enemy has set up his kingdom according to the influencers, according to those who have authority to influence, to attack them, to get them to do things that would, that would stop the kingdom of God and open the door to the kingdom of darkness. Yes, this is how they're structured. See, we know this because Jesus taught us these things. We also know because these things are readily in the Bible. Let me give you an example. 
in Ezekiel 28. Now we study this when we're in OSL. I think it's the, might be the third level, but it could be the fourth level. But we study this. In Ezekiel 28, God's telling Ezekiel to prophesy. And he says this, verse 2, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Now he's not saying, I want you to drive over there, you know, walk over there. No, I, I want you to speak this out. I want you to prophesy this. Say to the prince of Tyre. Now Sidon and Tyre, we recognize those two cities up on the northern coast above Israel, right on the Mediterranean. And here's, he's calling him the prince of Tyre. Everybody say prince of Tyre. Prince of Tyre, okay. Say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God. This human leader thinks he's a God. Why? Because there's some spiritual power that's going on in his life that makes him think, man, man, I, I'm something special. I'm a special human being. And so I can act special and I can dominate people in a special way. But watch this. God says, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. And then skip down now to verse 6. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations, and they shall draw their sword against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down to the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the sea. So God is telling Ezekiel, I want you to say this, tell this leader that you're calling the Prince of Tyre, you think you're a god, you think you're all that, right? And uh, I remember when my daughter, when she was a teenager, you know, years ago, she came in, Daddy, I said, what's wrong? Oh, th this, this girl in my class, she said, I think I'm all that. I said, you th she, think, she said, you think you're all that what? No, Daddy, she just said, you think <laughs> all that. I said, yeah, but she said, you think you're all that what? No, Daddy, that's it. That's all she said. I said, well, don't listen to her. She can't even complete a sentence. <laughs> so here's this, guy. here's this guy now. And the Lord's telling Ezekiel, prophesy and you say, you think you're a God. You're haughty. You're prideful. You're dominating these people. But you're not a God. You're just a man. And not only that, I'm going to send some enemy against you and I'm going to take you down. Isn't that right? Now watch this. Then you come down to... Verse 11, he's still talking. God says, Ezekiel, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel said, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Now, wait a minute, we were just talking to the prince of Tyre. And God said, now I want you to talk to the king of Tyre. Take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Look at verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers cherub, that's, that's an angelic being. What? I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Folks, this is talking about the devil. That he didn't start off as the devil. He started off as an angelic being created by God, anointed by God, but iniquity was found in him. He began to think he was all that. Is that right? He began to be prideful. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Isn't that right? So yeah, unfortunately, guess where he fell? He fell to the earth. And what does he do? He influences human leaders. This guy's called the Prince of Tyre, at least in the prophecy. In the natural realm, he may have been called the king. But God said, no, he's not the real king. There's another king. It's the devil that's influencing him and putting that same prideful spirit that makes him think he can make all of his own decisions, whether they're right or wrong, he's going to do it. And God said, now talk to the king of Tyre. And you tell him, I'm going to, I'm going to confront him too. See, God's not afraid of the devil, and we shouldn't be either. But see, we need to understand, yes, we need to play a part with the human leaders to vote and so on, but if we stop there, we're going to miss out on the real authority. We got to go over there. How many of you ever heard, we got to stop talking to the feet and start talking to the head. Isn't that right? How many of you ever, on a call, you say, uh, uh, could, uh, could I please talk to your manager, please? Could I please? Why? Because you're not able to do what I need you to do. 
I need to talk to somebody in authority. And let me tell you, Jesus has given us the authority. But if we don't use that authority, or if we try to only use it on human beings, we're not talking to the real leaders. We're not talking to the real influencers. And the Bible's telling us this. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities. We have to go up the ladder and confront the devil and the demonic spirits that are causing all these problems in our nation. Come on, somebody say amen to this. This is a big deal. Now listen, here's another place in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel began to fast and pray over the horrible things that were happening in Babylon where he was. So it said, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. And of course, Daniel was concerned about the Jewish people who had been taken captive and taken to Babylon. He said, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning. We would call this fasting and praying. Three full weeks, I ate no pleasant food. No meat, no wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day in the first month, as I was by the side of the great river and so on and so forth, I lifted up my eyes, verse 5, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose waist was girded with gold. You fast. This is an angel that came to him. Verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand up upright. Stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Now watch this, verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day, this was 21 days earlier, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. What words? His words of prayer. He was praying 21 days, fasting and praying. Your words were heard. Watch this. Your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Angels will move if we will pray. Angels will move if we will pray. I have come because of your words. And guess what? Angels will come because of your words and because of yours and yours and yours and yours and mine. But the enemy wants to tell us, just work with the flesh and blood. Just complain about what's going on. Just, just use the political talking points of whatever news organization or people you're listening to. No, we need to listen to God. And say, we got to go higher than that to the heavenlies. And we need to pray to the Lord God and come against these spirits. So he said, and I have come because of your words. Verse 13. But this angel said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Now, wait a minute. Is this a human being? No. He's coming from heaven to get to Daniel. And he's, he ran into some resistance, some traffic. The road was blocked. By who? By somebody that he called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Who is this? This is a demonic spirit that is influencing the kingdom of Persia. And the kingdom of Persia is saying, no, you're not going to come and answer Daniel's prayer. Why? Because that'll mess up my plan. That'll mess up my system. So there is war going on in the heavenlies. And this is what the Bible is explaining to us. But Daniel is down there praying, and God sends the angel and said, Hey, I got a man down there that finally started praying. Come on, go down and answer his prayer. Tell him we're going we're gonna to do that in spite of what the devil's doing, right? How many of you can see this? Right? Okay, so I've come because of your words. But the prince of the, power, uh, the, prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. I've been fighting this spirit 21 days. An angel fighting a demonic spirit for three solid weeks. Now watch this. He withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, this is Michael, the archangel of God. This is the big, the big dude, right? The big general. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there, watch this, with the kings of Persia. Oh, there are other spirits. See, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. These spirits are real. And they are, in, they are in a hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness. And Daniel's down here praying. He doesn't see all of that going on. He's just praying. He just knows, man, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. But something was happening because of his words. Are you listening to me? Something was happening. So he said, Michael, the archangel, came to help me. 
And he said, He came to help me, for I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. There were other demonic spirits resisting me, stopping me, blocking me from bringing the answer to your prayer. Verse 14, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. I'm coming to give you the answer to your prayer and to give you insight about how this is going to play out. Look at verse 20. Then Daniel said, he said to me, this spirit, this angel, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. Why? Because Michael's still up there fighting him. And I got to go back and fight this guy again. I, I'm going to go and fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. What did he say? He said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to help Michael, and we're going to take this Prince of Persia out, this demonic, these demonic spirits that are controlling Persia, that are influencing Persia. We're going to wipe these demonic spirits out. We're going to get rid of them. They're going to leave. And when, when they do, and we go on our way, the vacuum will be filled by the Prince of Greece. These are, that's another demonic spirit, and guess what happened in history? When after the kingdom of Persia, guess who came and dominated and took over? The prince of Greece. The kingdom of Greece. Surprise, surprise. See, it happened in the spirit first, the spirit realm, and then it happened in the natural realm. Folks, if we want to see real change, it's going to have to happen in the spirit realm first and then in the natural realm. Let me say it again. If we want to see real change, it's going to happen in the spirit realm first and then in the natural realm. It's not going to happen in the election first. You understand? Now, is the election important? Yes. But we better have been praying because post-election, heavenly wars are still going on. Heavenly battles are still going on. We got to know who we are. We got to see bigger than just what's happening in the news. You're not going to find out everything about who won and who's, who lost, who's winning and who's losing by watching the news on election night. Somebody said, no, because it's going to take longer to cut, count those ballots. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, <laughs> no, you're not going to find out, even when we find out all the results of all the congressmen and all that, you, we're not going to find out. We have, to, we have to understand that we must win in the heavenlies. Yeah. Are you listening? We must win. So I'm going to show you how we're supposed to win. Jesus told us what our ultimate assignment is, by the way. Let's not lose sight of our ultimate assignment. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Our ultimate assignment is not to get a party elected. Could that play a part? Absolutely it could play a part. But that's not what we're really after. We're watching in the nations that are the most close to the gospel, revival breaking out. Because the church realizes we have to fight in the spirit. And we're watching in some nations where there's a lot of freedom, the church being complacent spiritually, not winning their nation to the Lord because they're focusing more on natural things, more on prosperity things, more on just, you know, being comfortable. What, what can we do to keep our lives comfortable? And we're watching that if, when things go dark, the church comes alive. The church comes alive. You listening to me? Somebody said, oh, so should we vote for it to go dark? No, that's not what I'm saying. No, we shouldn't pray for it to be dark. We shouldn't vote for it to be dark. We should always go after light. However, we should also understand that no matter what happens, God will use it to our advantage. Our God is wise and smart. Our God is wise. So Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations. Verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. So there are four things we need to do. I mean, we're in the heat of the battle. We need to know how to fight. But here's, here's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how we win. I don't just want to fight. I want to win. Can somebody say amen? I don't just want to fight. I want to win. So let me give you four things here. Number one, we need to pray fervently. We need to pray fervently. James 5, 16. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. But notice the earnest prayer. Not just, Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord. We just pray. Lord, just that, that, Lord, that you would do, you know, Lord, help, help, help this situation, Lord, right now. And, and Lord, just, Lord, just cause peace in people, Lord. And what kind of a wimpy prayer is that? <laughs> Jesus said... 
No one comes into a strong man's house and plunders his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Satan and demonic forces have been running things too long. We need to come and we need to address the kingdom of darkness and Satan himself. And we need to say, in the name of Jesus, I'm speaking to you who have been influencing and controlling the United, the United States and our state and our city, speaking to you and saying, in the name of Jesus, you will no longer influence. I'm commanding you to be quiet. I'm commanding you to leave. Now, see, the, the problem that we have is we have other human beings that have authority on this earth that open their big mouths and invite them back in. That's why we have to continue to pray. Everybody listening to me? It's not unbelief for us to pray it again and again because we know we're not the only ones on this earth that have authority to invite demons to come in or to tell them to leave. There are other human beings that invite them right back in. So that's why the good news is, you know, we know what we're doing. When you know, like for example, just say you're in a gunfight. Now, I hope you're never in a gunfight, but just say you're in a gunfight. Well, if you have a gun and you know how to use that gun and you know uh, you've been trained on how to use it, but somebody else has a gun but doesn't realize they have a gun. They got something. They don't know what it is. They don't know the difference between the handle and the trigger. You understand what I'm saying? They may not even know which way to point the gun. How many of you know you have the advantage? Because you know how the gun works. You've been trained on how to use it, which, which direction it should be pointed. See, and so we understand weaponry in the spirit better than the world does. Therefore, we can be more intentional. One of the tactics of the devil is just to get us to not pray. Just get involved in the natural things, politics and such. And that's coming up too. But that's not the highest. The highest is, no, we're going we're to come after you and your demonic spirit. Somebody say amen to this. We must do it. And we must not just talk about it. We must do it. So we're going to close out today. We're going to do some of that. Number two, we do need to vote and help other believers to vote. We do. Why? Because Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt flavors. We should flavor this earth with the kingdom principles of God. Salt preserves. Did you know that? Preserves from decay. And salt also causes a thirst. When we give testimony about how good God is, it makes people thirsty to want God. So we need to be the salt of the earth. So we need to vote and we need to help other believers vote. And let's show our influence. Third, we need to disciple everyone we can. Let's not lose sight of that and just think it's just an election victory. No, there are unbelievers that need to be discipled. That's our real assignment. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations. That's what we're after. Whether, whether we have good political leaders or bad political leaders, we need to disciple people. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And not just argue politics with everybody. They need to know the Word of God. And fourth, we need to start praying. We need to start praying disciple-making churches. We need to start praying disciple-making churches everywhere. Let me tell you why. Because... Studies have shown again and again that new churches that are planted reach unbelievers. I, I just saw a statistic that, you know, there, there are a number of huge churches. Uh, churches over 2,000 are called mega churches. OK, so we crossed that threshold a long time ago. But I think when you get past 10,000 and 10,000 up, 10, 15, 20 and, and upward, those are those are called giga churches. OK. But let me tell you what the studies show. The studies show that 96% of the growth of those churches are transfer growth from other churches. In other words, they're growing. People love their preaching and music and such. But are they reaching the unbelievers? And the answer is, by and large, no. And this is why we need to be planting new churches out in neighborhoods and harvest so it can begin to reach those unbelievers. Everybody with me? Yes. See, this is not just about what church do you like to go to? What kind of music do you like? What kind? It's not about what I like. It's about us accomplishing the Great Commission. I must, I must do church to accomplish the assignment, not to be comfortable, not to enjoy. The church is not for my entertainment. I'm a part of the church to carry out the Great Commission. 
Therefore, we must have the right targets on the wall before we start shooting, before we even start choosing our arrows. We must know, but what are we supposed to do? We've got to reach unbelievers and we've got to make disciples. So we've got to start churches in Acts 9.31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, see, there were many, Galilee, Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they, these churches, were multiplied. They were multiplied. we got to multiply churches. More new churches mean more new believers and more new disciples. More new churches mean more new believers and more new disciples. That's why. Because it's not about us. Well, I just like it the way it was. For who? For you. But it's not about you. This life is so short. When we get to the end, Jesus is going to want to know, what did you do to help me to reach the rest of the world? I died for the whole world. Well, I don't know, but I tell you what, I got this new flat screen TV, and man, I like it. How many of you know this is so shallow, the way that we talk, the way that we live our lives? We've got to be about the Great Commission. Can somebody say amen to this? we got to do it. And so therefore, we've got to continue to plant churches. This is why the Lord has told us, plant house churches as fast as you can. And of course, make disciples. Reach unbelievers and make disciples. And that's what we're going to do. If the Lord has called you to do that, go to our website and click on house churches and get signed up to become certified. We'll walk you through the whole process. We'll empower you. We'll, we'll equip you. We're partnering together in this, but we got to do it. And we're going to reach a lot of unbelievers. So here we are. I mean, we're just, we could almost say hours away from an election. And we don't know how long it's going to take for this thing to play out and for us to know the outcomes and such. But nonetheless, we got to do our due diligence in the spirit. Is that right? Everybody in this room, let's stand up together, can we? Right where you are, if you're able to do it, let's stand up together. Let's stand up. And uh, let's do something that is not to be limited to just this time. Let's pray right now. Let's just, let's just take this short time and let's pray. And this will make a difference, but also as we continue to pray, as I, as you continue to pray, it'll make a difference. I'm going to ask you just for the sake of time and clarity and agreement, if you'll repeat after me. Of course, you won't do that all the time, but while we're just here, repeat after me. Let's come and pray something. We're going to pray according to the Word of God. Praise God. Everybody, come on, say, Father God. You who are in heaven, holy is your name. We honor you. You are God. And we say your kingdom come. And your will be done in the United States of America as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, regarding this election, your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, bring surprises. Change things that look unchangeable. Bring about your glory. Save this nation. And now I speak to Satan and all the demonic realm influencing our nation. And I say in the name of Jesus, be quiet and be gone. Be removed. Give way to the Lord Jesus Christ. Give way to the Word of God. Give way to the Gospel. Give way to the righteous people. In the name of Jesus, I speak to all your strategies and I declare over this nation no weapon formed against this nation will prosper. In the name of Jesus, they will not work. They will not prosper. Jesus is Lord of this nation. And righteousness will exalt this nation. So Father God, have your way. Turn the tide toward righteousness, toward your plan. And may this the whole nation turn back to you. May there be more disciples. May there be more churches. May there be more believers than ever before. 
because of your love and your power and your truth. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. And let's clap our hands and say amen to that. Can we? Amen. 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 Now let me tell you, this is how we win. We win by prioritizing the spirit realm. Yes, we have to play our part in the natural realm. We're the salt of the earth. Yes. But we win by prioritizing the spirit realm and taking out those spirits. And by the way, anytime now human beings are going to be saying things that invite them back in. So when, they, when it comes to mind, just open your mouth up and say, yep, all you spirits, evil spirits that have been influencing our nation, in Jesus' name, you must be quiet. See, we just shut them back down. Let me tell you, if, if you have to shut up about every five minutes, how many of you know that disrupts your ability to influence? Is that right? No, we have authority. But we got to keep using it because, unfortunately, lots of human beings will use their authority to invite them back in. So, so let's use our weaponry with precision and repeatedly. I mean, let's be like machine guns in the spirit, praying, 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 praying. And let's pray in the spirit with spiritual language so the Holy Spirit can say whatever he wants to say. He always prays the perfect will of God, Romans 8 tells us. Isn't that right? He always prays the perfect will of God. So I want to say to everybody with us today, everybody here, everybody watching with us today, that the Lord is on our side. We're, we, the body of Christ, are not first Republicans or Democrats or any independents. No, we are first the body of Christ. That is where our identity is, in Christ, first. And so we're secure. What we're trying to do is help other folks, help other people find their way, help our nation find its way. That's what we're doing. But we are secure. Let's keep our identity where it really is. We are citizens of heaven. Jesus said, we are not of this world. Ah, we are not of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And so let's keep our confidence up. Let's not let any of this political stuff get us down. Ah, oh, this, is, this, this is just worldly stuff. And yeah, we're here to influence it, but this ain't our home. We got a home in heaven we'll be going to shortly. But while we're here, we're gonna use our authority. Come on, somebody say amen to this. Come on, let's give Jesus praise today. Thank God for helping us to have the right perspective, and then we can keep our joy and keep our peace. In the midst of the turmoil, we keep our joy. So on election night, don't you get discouraged, and don't you get overjoyed just by that win, if that's what happens with you. No, let's just say, thank you, Lord, you got all this in control. We'll just pray all through election night. Thank you, Lord, you got this. Amen. God is good. Then we can all stay in unity. Amen. The enemy wants to divide the body of Christ. No, we're not going to let him do that. We're going to stay with God on the word of God. Well, God is a good God. I'm so glad you're with us today. This is how we win. And we, we are going to win. We're not going to give up on this in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, I bless everyone today. I bless your people, your body strengthen them. Oh, may clarity remain in their hearts and minds. May we not be distracted away from the, the simple clarity of the kingdom of God and the agenda that God has given us, the assignment that God has given us. And Lord, bless, protect, prosper your people as they serve you and seek your will. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us today, and we'll see you next week.